As I begin, I want to thank uh, Jim for taking last week uh, at short notice, and uh, I'm mostly over all my cold and all this mess, but uh, as you can hear if you know me, uh, <clears throat> there, there's residuals left, uh, the cough that doesn't go away, and my son and daughter still have it, uh, and they're a week or two ahead of me, each of them, so <clears throat> uh, bear with me as I might clear my throat a few times here and there, but um, <clears throat> as we get started, I want to thank Doug for his vulnerability, for his openness, for his willingness to share and for Jim stepping up and helping him out. Um, I know myself, there have been times when I uh, have been up here, uh, not here, but historically, uh, where I got too emotional and I could not continue. It was very difficult. And uh, a result of that is that now, I'm like, sometimes I can cry and keep talking. <laughs> I've, I've worked through to somehow maintain some composure, but it, it's a lot of work and it's hard. And it, <clears throat> and when you're in a situation where Doug is at in his life and the moving and the transitions that are coming, it's such a great challenge. And many of you know that well. You've had a few of those in your life. And so we all love you, Doug, and thank you for being you and for being here with us <clears throat> in all the ways that you are you. We love you. <clears throat> um, so a part of that is the, the story of our church. The story of the world, the story that we tell ourselves every day is that uh, we, we can deal with, we can handle, we will do, we will conquer, we will take care of, we will, whatever it is, there's a story that we're playing out in our lives every day. And um, when we talk about the story, sometimes people say, that's so meta, and this isn't Facebook, <clears throat> and I'm not getting paid to promote Meta, which is the owner now of Facebook, and you know, uh, it's a mess, but we're not doing that. Um, the idea is that there is a Meta story, there is the great overarching story of Scripture, the Meta narrative of it, as it's called, and um, in short, I want to share with you what that is. It is creation, Genesis 1 and 2, right? The world was created. It is the fall, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve eat the fruit, mess it up. It is Israel, <clears throat> the, the, the cycle of life that, that continues from Abraham forward, right, into the time of the church, which is redemption, when Jesus begins his ministry and tells his story, dies, is buried, and resurrected, and, and the church begins... Uh, 50 days later on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and that is the redemption of Israel and the redemption of the world, um, in essence. But actually, consummation, which we often call revelation, uh, the book of Revelation, and we think, oh, that's the end. It's the end times, the apocalypse. But apocalypse means to reveal. It does not mean the destruction of all things. And so when you study apocalypse, what you're talking about is the revelation, the opening up, the understanding of, of things from a better, greater, bigger perspective. And so um, the consummation is the idea of the whole world being made right. And that's Romans uh, chapter 8, where Paul says that all of creation has been crying out, groaning for the redemption of the world and the redemption of the saints, which then would thereby set off the rest of it, right? And so um, this is the meta-narrative, the story of Scripture. Creation, fall, Israel, redemption, consummation. And every time you read the Bible, it's important to remember that everything is situated within a story. And our lives are one big story. And it's important to remember that those stories inform us, change us, shape us, underpin our culture, our society, help to explain how we view everything, how we think about the world, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is, what is like something to be valued, what is something to be devalued. Like all of that comes from the stories that we live in and the stories we tell ourselves. So, um, this, this sermon series is in, uh, a series of Advent, if you will, the idea of Jesus' coming. We're anticipating the coming of Christmas, but we would, uh, in some sense, also be anticipating the coming of Christ, that he is going to be born, and that we are going to celebrate his birth, 
And then a few months later, we're going to celebrate his death. But actually, in the Church of Christ, we always say, we celebrate his birth, death, resurrection, the gospel every Sunday, communion. <laughs> but at this time of year, the world is looking and they're saying, Christmas, Christmas, I have to buy presents, I have to do this, I have to da 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 even Jewish people. I have neighbors that are Jewish and are like, we celebrate Christmas too because, you know, it's, it's a cultural thing. Everybody does it. And so we put up a tree and we da-da-da-da. And I'm like, wow, interesting. But to really celebrate Christmas is to celebrate the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ, the anticipation, the expectation that God is coming. So my Advent series is called, Is God With Us? Why would I turn it into a question? Well, because the story of the Bible is asking that question. The whole story is saying, is God with us? But you might flip it around and say, are we with God? And so as we go through this series, we're going to ask those questions again and again and again. And today, we're going to kick off the journey, if you will. We're going to tell the big story, the first part. The first parts. <laughs> It's really hard to tell the first part without telling the first parts, especially since we only have a few weeks to do this. So as we get started on this, um, starting of the journey, let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would open our hearts to you again, that we would feel and know and understand you, that we would see life from your perspective, and that our hearts would be turned into your story, and that we would not be so focused on ourselves as the hero that we would turn to Jesus and you and the Spirit as the heroes of the whole Bible, that you have set before us life and death and offered us health and healing and understanding and wisdom, and that, and, and that when we cry out for you in our story, recognizing that it's really your story, you set us free to experience all that is good in the world. May you do that today. In Jesus we pray. Amen. So, Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story, like, pretty simple. We've been over this a few times since I've been here, but, I mean, you guys all know it, don't you? But at the same, it is the retelling of the story that shapes us. We are a culture that is a, a, a book project uh, or a book club that's stuck on one book. We can't leave it. You realize that, right? We, we are a book club that cannot walk away from the Bible. We have no other book we focus on so much. Like, we just keep going back to it. And that's a good thing, because it shapes us into the people we desire to be. Because we believe it is a message from God, or at least a message about God for us, telling us how everybody else has ever experienced God and how they think of him. Now, in truth, if you're a believer and you're in church and you're like, no, this is... This is God's word to me, I know that he gave us that Bible, then, then that's a whole different thing, isn't it? Some people, they read the Bible and they go, there's some wisdom in there. You know, I don't really believe in Jesus and I don't really believe in God, but man, you read that, you'll learn some stuff. You know, that's a good place to start, isn't it? It's a good place to start to say there is something meaningful and deep about the scriptures that we can gain wisdom from, even if we don't believe all of it, right? But as somebody who does believe, it's important that we recognize there are greater truths to be found the more you buy in, the more you believe, the more you give yourself to the story. So in Genesis 1 and 2, this story is being told in a setting among many creation stories, many stories that are told in that culture, in that society that say, our God did it this way. Our gods did it this way. This is how it came about. And the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2 is saying, our God was not at war with anyone. He didn't have to chop somebody up to make the oceans and the sky and the sea and the heavens and the earth. And, and he, he didn't use, you know, parts of other gods to create the humans. <laughs> but our God did this. He spoke. And he said, this, this is what I love. This is good. This is right. I, I, want, I want these things to work this way. And this is beautiful. And in that, he made all that we see and all that we understand 
That's the story of Genesis 1 and 2. But a part of it is also the story of man and woman, humanity. That in the beginning, they were created good, pure, perfect, wonderful. And, and we understand that they were made male and female. And then they were both called to work together as God's chosen representatives on earth. That in fact, the idea of an icon, the idea of an idol, that same word is used for them <clears throat> to represent God to the world. That they are the image bearers of God. And that they are called to spread his kingdom, his goodness, his kindness, his love, his sense of order upon the chaos. Because as you grow, you start to see that Genesis 1 and 2 tells about a place called Eden, where two people live. And outside of the walls of that garden is chaos. But they are called to have children. And as they grow the family of humanity, they are called to spread the borders of that kingdom and, and take care of a greater garden continuously. So that the whole world one day would be put right and beautiful in God's eyes. But what did they do? <clears throat> what did they do? Genesis 3, the fall, right? The story of the fall. There was something they weren't allowed to touch. Well, no, they, they, weren't, they weren't told they couldn't touch it. They were told they couldn't eat it, right? And they, they took of it, though. They ate it. And then they, their eyes were open. The tree of good and evil. And they, they realized, this is... This is not what we thought. Oh, no. And then they ran and they hid. But in that story, there's, there's this sense that they hid in the very tree that they ate from. That they didn't run all that far. They ate from the tree, and then they went and they hid in that tree. And it's very, very psychologically amazing and astute, the, the wisdom that is boiled down in that story that, that shows us that no matter the choices we're given, we want the thing that we're not supposed to have. If we know there's cookies in the cookie jar and we're not allowed to have them, we go for them. Sometimes we take them and eat them in the bathroom and hide. But we don't, we've never done that ourselves, have we? No. <laughs> not me. But you know it to be true because you've, you've done it. I've done it. We've all done it. We take that thing that we're not supposed to take and we enjoy it in a way we're not supposed to enjoy it. And then we, we, we feel the ramifications of that. We are overcome by the guilt, the shame, the fear, the, oh no, what if somebody finds out? And then we try to hide it. No, I didn't do that. We deny it. No, no, I didn't do that. We blame shift. Somebody else did it. They made me do it. It was their fault. And the same thing has been happening from Genesis chapter 3 on to today, right? We, we all do this. It's the rare individual who stands up and says, no, 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 it was me. I took the fruit. I ate it. Yeah, I can see now. Like, I can see like I couldn't see before. Yeah, I'm, I'm naked, but that's cool. I'm down with that. <laughs> like, no, who does that? Like, it is incredibly off-putting if somebody does that. And we would say that they're, they're, there's something really wrong with them if they live that way, right? We would call them a sociopath. And why? Because they have no empathy, no feeling, no connection to others. They're not aware of the, the shame that they're presenting to the world by walking around naked, unhindered, just freely spouting off all the things that they now see that nobody else is supposed to talk about. It's like the emperor's new clothes, right? <laughs> like, we hide all of that. We, we don't want people to talk about those things. We, we want people to, to speak in a different way. We want them to, to be civil and, and, you know, composed and, and behave well and, and, you know, maintain their cool, their calm. Their, like, don't, don't be like that. But in this story of Genesis 3 in the fall, what happens? They eat the fruit. They run, they hide. God comes to them and says, hey, you've eaten the fruit. And they're like, who told you? How do you know? <laughs> right? <laughs> and... And oh, she did it. No, no, the snake did it. And then God goes, well, snake, you're done. Uh, you're going to crawl on your belly from now on. It's going to be hard for you. And woman, uh, you, your desire is going to be for your husband, but you know, you're going to give birth one day, and the seed will come from you that will crush that snake's head. And, and, and man, you, 
You're going to have some real bad things. You're going to sweat. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to work. You're going to eat. It's going to go bad for you. You're going to have to work hard to eat. And, and, and you know. And, oh, but, but here, here's some better clothing. You, you need animal skins because the fig leaves, well, the leaves, they're not working. The, those leaves, you're covering up stuff that it's not going to cover. It's not going to work. It's uncomfortable. It's going to fall apart. You, you don't have perspective, young man, young woman, Adam, Eve. You cannot see far enough into the future, but trust me, after a day or two, those leaves aren't working. So here's some animal skins for you. I'm going to cover up your sin. I'm going to cover up your shame. I'm going to make you comfortable. I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, imagine this. How long does it take to tan a, a hide, to take leather, to kill an animal, to skin it, to, to, and then stretch that leather and do all the things and treat that leather and then be able to wear it? Like you don't immediately kill the animal and put on the skin. Like, that doesn't work. So whatever God did, he did like that. I mean, just instantaneously, bam, this is leather, and, and you're going to wear it. And, and God protected them from themselves in that way and made for them a, a space that would be better, healthier. And yet he removed them from the garden, and in removing them from the garden, <clears throat> there's a downward cycle that continues, Right? I mean, you would think Adam and Eve, they messed up. We're going to have some good times for a little while. But then there's Cain and Abel, right? And in Cain and Abel, you're thinking, where's the snake crusher? Where's the one that's going to stop Satan, stop the bad guy, like fix the world? Where's this guy at? Well, Cain kills Abel, and you go, this isn't right. Why did he do it? How did it happen? And in a story like this long... I mean, really, it's incredibly short. There's incredible amounts of information given. It's Adam and Eve are presented as of one bone, one flesh. Cain and Abel are presented as one is the tiller of the earth and one is the keeper of flocks. They're shown to be different immediately. And we, we get this, and then, then the, one can control his temper and the other can't. One offers a good sacrifice, the other does not. And one gets angry and hot-headed, and God says, hey, watch out, sin will destroy you. And what happens? It does. Sin gets the better of him, and he kills his brother, smashes his head, right, with a rock. Like, that's not a snake crusher, that's a brother killer. That's not okay. And we know that that's wrong. Every culture goes, that's bad. That, that's your own issue. You failed. Your brother didn't fail. Your brother did well. Can't you celebrate him? No, I can't. I have to be envious and jealous, and I'm going to let it go totally, and I'm going to destroy him. Wow. Like, and we learn from that, and we say, that's bad. That is not okay. I have to learn self-control. I have to maintain a sense of my emotions, even when I don't like the outcome for the other. I cannot... Kill them. Like, right? I mean, most of us understand, even if there was no law against murder, we would, we would not think murder is a good idea. Especially of your brother or your sister, you know, close relative. That's a, that's a bad idea. Like, just, it doesn't work. And then, spiral further, Genesis chapter 4, the end of it, uh, Cain, and Tubal Cain, and, 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 and then Lamech. And, and he takes two wives, and then he, he says, I killed a man for just saying some words. Uh, if Cain's cursed this much, I'm going to be cursed more. Curse me more. Curse me way more. I am a terrible, horrible person, and I am violent, and everyone will fear me. And we're like, whoa, this dude's bad. Like, he is not okay. Like, that is really... And then it just continues to spiral. Genesis chapter 5, and, and here comes Noah. And we're looking for Noah, and we're saying, Noah, can you kill the snake? Can you fix it? And we think, oh, great. And then God called on Noah to build the ark. And Noah's name even means like rest or something, right? And so we're like, yay, Noah, he's going to do it. And he, he kind of does, except God kills the whole of humanity except for his family, right? And starts over. And then what happens? Noah, he plants a vineyard. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I read that story and I thought, Man, that's, he just immediately got drunk. How long does it take to plant a vineyard, grow that crop, and, and then make wine from it? Or alcohol of any kind. I mean, it takes a long time. 
But the story is just boom, compacted. Boom, here it is. And he's drunk. And his brother, not his brother, his son does something to him inappropriate, terribly wrong, horribly bad. And the euphemism there is maybe he uh, assaulted his father in some way, right? Um, now, then his other two brothers come in and, and kind of fix the dad's situation. But when the dad gets up, he curses him. And he says, cursed be Canaan. It was Ham that did it to him, but cursed be Canaan. His children will be cursed. Oh, no. And, and in some sense, we learn from, from these just beginning stories that when somebody's dad is messed up, their sons are likely to be messed up. Their children are, it's going to be hard for them to overcome their parents' behaviors and, and practices. And it's going to be a real struggle. But we just keep seeing the spi spiral down, down, down until Noah, Noah lifts us back up and gives us hope. And then at the same time, slams us into the ground and tells us, he's not the Savior. He's not the one to fix it. He can't. He won't. And then we think, well... Okay, he's got two good sons, one bad son. This is better than Cain versus Abel, right? <laughs> and then there's Seth. But eh, Seth, he didn't, he didn't do very much, right? I mean, it's his lineage that Noah comes from. And then we think, okay, so, so maybe there's some hope. So there's two boys versus one boy, and let's see what happens. And then the Tower of Babel shows up, right? Genesis 11. And it just, it's like, what? What are they thinking? We don't need you, God. We're going to build this big old tower. We're going to go all the way up to heaven. We're going to tell you to your face we don't need you. Like, that's what they're doing. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're sticking it right here. And God had already told Noah, you remember that thing I said in the garden? Go out and, like, conquer the world? Not in a negative, harsh way, but in a set it right. Tame the chaos. You know, domesticate the place. Make it beautiful. Make it a garden. Make it a place that, that you want to live. And they say, we're not going anywhere. We're going to build a city, we're going to build a tower, and we're going to tell God we don't need him. And God goes, well, we'll see about that. He comes down and scatters them all, right? And they're all scattered all over the whole world because their language is confused at Babel, and it sounds like, well, blah, 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 right? Babel, babble, babble. They don't know how to talk. And we think, this is, this is not good. Come on, God. You, what are you going to do? And that's where we come to Abraham's story. But it's told as Terah's story. You see, this is the account of Terah's family line. Here's Terah, father of Abram. And Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And, and he became also, Haran became the father of Lot, so the grandfather. Yeah, yeah. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. So there's a problem. What are we going to do? Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his granddaughter, or his, I'm sorry, daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. <clears throat> they were going to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Why were they going to Canaan? What was it that was going to happen? What was, what was this struggle that was happening that they said, we have to leave here? Was it because of the death of this child? Or was it because of, of something else? Did God call to Terah and say, hey, move your family. It's time. Let's, let's get you moving. And, and that is what many scholars will say is that they believe that the overwhelming call was to Terah first. But Terah did not listen fully. Instead, he went part way, and he settled in Haran because it was more comfortable. He didn't want to keep traveling. So then, Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. And the Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And now there's this call to a journey. There's this call to again go with God, to follow God, to be with God. And, and this is the struggle of, of, of people, always. I mean, it was the call from the beginning, right? Genesis chapters 1 and 2 are God saying, I have a journey for you to take. It's a journey that's going to happen within a small space. 
But the journey is going to take a long time. You're going to be here, and you're going to deal with these two trees, but you're going to take care of this garden all around it. You're going to make it beautiful. And as you have children and grow as a family, you're going to grow this space and grow this in a way. It's going to be a journey for the ages that we're going to revolutionize the entire world from here on out. And they, they couldn't. They didn't. So here, now God has spread them over the face of the earth, and he's calling out to his last remaining follower, the last person on earth, it would seem, that has a desire to be near him. I mean, that's the way the story goes. There's a narrowing again and again down to Abram. And he says, go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. And he gives this promise. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this is the, the, the Jewish manifesto that anybody who curses them, God is cursing. And anybody who blesses them, God is blessing. To this day, the Jews live by this. And to this day, many Christians believe that this is their calling too because we're grafted into that same community, right? And we ask ourselves at this point in the story, is Abram going to crush the snake? Is he the one that we've been told from, from the beginning, from Genesis chapter 3, is going to come to fix the mess? And it sounds like it, doesn't it? Like, I'm going to make you into somebody. You're going to get big. You're going to be awesome. Your family's going to be phenomenal. This is, this is going to be a great thing, right? So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. They made it. They completed the journey, it would seem, and life is now good, right? But Genesis 15 through 20, or 20 through 50, I'm sorry. I don't know how that weird number got in my head. 12 through 50. In Genesis 12 through 50, we see the remaining story of this first family of the Israelite nation, right? The family that follows God. All, all the Israelites say, we are the sons of Abraham, right? We even sing songs that we're the son of Abraham. We, we sing it though. Father Abraham had many sons. Right? You remember that song? Yeah. Many sons had Father Abraham. And, and there's hand motions and everything. But <clears throat> the idea being that here's Abraham, a man who listened to God and followed God. But if you le listen to the story and read the story, we find very quickly he is not the promised snake crusher. He's not the one that's going to fix it all. Instead, he is just one in a long line of people that are struggling to follow God. Because very quickly we learn Abraham lies. And he kind of cheats. And he, he kind of doesn't do everything right. But he's still considered a father to the faithful. A father of those who have faith. And even the New Testament holds him up as such. And in fact, the whole way through Scripture... We're reminded again and again that there's one perfect. His name is Jesus. And that we struggle. We struggle to follow God. All of us. And, and that is the story of the Bible. And as we tell that story, we come to our faith challenges. And we say we need to recognize these questions that we asked in the beginning. We need to recognize that we always ask is God with you? Is God with me? Where is God? Is he here? Like, do I have to go and search for him? Do I have to go and find him? Well, why, why doesn't he just... Why? Are you with me, God? But the better question is, always, am I, are you, with God? God hasn't left. <laughs> he didn't run away. He is still present. The issue greater than all of that is, will I recognize my struggle and recognize my weakness? Will I recognize my humanity? 
that I am like all the characters in the Bible. That even though I want to be faithful, I struggle to be faithful. Even though I want to do what's right, and sometimes do some good stuff, I mess up. I speak too harshly. I'm overly critical. I, I attack people I shouldn't. I say things I shouldn't. I tell stories I shouldn't. I watch stories I shouldn't. I'm involved in things that I shouldn't be involved in. And is God okay with that? I mean, does he think it's a good thing? No. But does he recognize that you're like all the other beings that have ever lived on this earth? Yes. And so the struggle is maintaining the relationship in the midst of this tension. Where I cry out to God, where are you? And he says, I'm here. And I say, where'd you go? And he said, I didn't go anywhere, you did. (laughs) And the whole time as I follow God, I have to remind myself that the greatest question I can ask is, am I with God? Am I following God? Because he is present. He is here. The question is, will I acknowledge his presence and in my humility accept that? We're always looking for a hero. We're always looking for someone that we can look up to. We're always looking for someone that's going to set it right, that's going to make it good. And that is Jesus. He is the hero of heroes of heroes, but he isn't heroic in the Superman, Batman, you know, galaxy, whatever, defenders of the galaxy type way. He's not your Han Solo or whatever, right? He, He isn't that hero. He is the hero that says, here I am to serve and die. Will you come with me? Will you join me on that journey? Will you suffer and serve and die? Let's pray as Jesus has taught us to. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Father, as we continue to pray, we ask that you would open our hearts to you again and again, that we would see our place in your story, and that we would struggle, as we should, to see you, and that we would struggle, as we should, to find you. And yet, may we know that you are with us the whole way through, that you have never left us, and that you will not forsake us. God, let us turn to you again and again because it is we who have left. It's in Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. If there's any way that we can encourage you, bless you, strengthen you this morning, if you need to put on Christ, if you need to be baptized, if you want to talk about this, any of this further, let me know. We'd love to hear from you.